Today, we're going to be focusing on the study of empires within the biblical context. And this happens to be the uh, focus of my dissertation. So hopefully you'll enjoy it um, as much as I do. Um, so I'm hoping that you all read uh, Daniel 2, at least. Uh, we're going to be focusing on two chapters in Daniel, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Um, and they really focus on empire. So today's sort of theme is looking at images of empire. So obviously, we're going to be looking at text. But I thought a good way to start is actually to look at visual images and sort of just get our brains going with what's, what's involved in an image, what can we read about the empire out of the image, what do we unpack it, what does it show us about the people you know, creating the image, are they at all influenced by the empire's own vi vi image of itself. Um, so I will start us off with the first one. Anyone recognize this? Okay, yeah, Xerxes I heard. Anyone know where this is from? Okay, I heard a lot, 300. So you might have seen the movie. This is taken from the graphic comic um, by Frank Miller. And so if you've seen the movie or read the comic, it's dealing with the um, attempted invasion of Greece by the Persians in the fifth century. And this is the encounter between King Leonidas of Sparta. He's the man down there in the red cape um, with the Persian emperor Xerxes. So obviously, this is fictionalized. And it's coming out of you know, modernity. This is Frank Miller's view of empire. But I thought it would sort of be a good way to start off. So if this is the Persian empire up above, this is the, the image of it, what would you sort of say is being displayed here? I mean, Frank Miller, what's going through his head in, in depicting Persia this way? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, very wealthy. What makes you say that? Yeah, it's really right. He's draped in gold, clearly. He, is, he doesn't want for any kind of jewelry. Um, and then this weird you know, contraption that he's on is obviously all gold. What else? So yeah, clearly it's supposed to be empire equals wealthy. Seems to be hammered home here. Anything? Yeah. The empire is also oppressive because holding up his little yeah. Yeah, I know. It's sort of hard to see. Those little white things coming are legs. So it's people bent over, and they're carrying this yeah, weird thing on, his, on their backs. Um, you know, rather than even having animals pull it, yeah, people are doing it. So he's wealthy. He has lots of people to serve him. Um, maybe they're like captured slaves from other areas. So it um, sort of shows the expanse of his empire. Anything else strike you? What about the emperor himself? So you see him obviously on the left, but can you see him? He's the dark figure at the top. Yeah. The scale of the emperor and also the statues are really like imposing. Right. So you can see just because Leonidas is in the foreground, he's really the same size um, as the emperor in the background. But yet, so that meaning that the emperor is really large. And if you've seen the movie, when they actually stand next to each other, he's almost like twice the size. So. You know, and part of that, any guesses as to why he might be portrayed sort of larger than life, larger than the average human, even against you know, this mighty king of Sparta? Any guesses? If you remember the movie or know the book, you'll sort of know what he says about himself. Well, he's actually, I mean, he says he's divine. So he's, he is a deity. He is a god. So that sort of comes across in that the emperor is really a divine being ruling the empire. Um, and so then you see it's portrayed, you know, he's, he's larger than life because he is larger than this average human. So again, it's interesting just to see how this empire, this emperor in particular, is portrayed um, in this modern comic. So we're actually going to deal with the Persians in a little bit. Um, and see if it sort of lines up with this view. But then I have a few other political cartoons um, dealing with empire. What do you make of this one? You can sort of, it's a little hard to read. Yeah, so English empire. Um, and how is it portrayed? I mean, think about, again, positive versus negative. Who do you think is drawing this comic, or this cartoon? Somebody that's oppressed. What makes you say that? Right, so it's like sort of an octopus, right, and, he, and he's actually physically 
grabbing these territories. You see Ireland is um, there on the right, and, and, you know, they're, and they're almost shifting them from where they actually are in the geography. Um, right, so it, it portrays the British Empire as, as you know, expansive, but also greedy. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, and if you've heard that sort of famous quote that the sun never sets on the British Empire because it was so expansive that at some point the sun was always shining on some you know, place that was in the British Empire. So, right, it's, it's drawing exactly on that. And I think the British Empire is the largest empire that's ever existed um, with the most territory. But yeah, this is clearly portraying it as a greedy sort of land, literally land grabbing entity. Um, and, it, and the interesting thing is, now we see it sort of portrayed as an animal figure, which we're going to see a lot of coming up. So keep that in mind. So I think you're right that it's coming from those who are sort of subject to the empire and perhaps critical of it. Um, but I don't know if the British Empire would have been upset to sort of think of itself as you know, expansive and sort of taking over the whole world. I mean, you've got it sort of across a bunch of you know, pieces of land and continents. Um, OK, so next one. What about this one? So sort of, this is a little trickier to get who they are, to know a little European history too, which obviously is not my area. But if anyone sort of knows it, any, any guesses is where it's coming from. That should be, yeah, Fanny. Well, it's in French. Yeah, OK, good. That's always important to think about language. Um, OK, so probably a French perspective. Um, and obviously, early 1900s. Uh, what do you think the spider is? Right, so again, we've got the British Empire, clearly with the map on its back. Uh, what about the image of a spider itself? I mean, what does that sort of say about British Empire? Yeah, the actual um, agreement that's uh, it's termed here, La Tante Cordiale, is actually an agreement right between the French and the British to sort of agree to basically disagree about where they're going to have land. So it's a pact between them. Um, but what's interesting is, OK, so if we think it's coming out of France and they have a pact with England, yet England is portrayed as this spider, which I don't think is probably, you know, a positive portrayal. And you can't really see, but it's hard to see, but there's a French soldier in the spider's mouth. I don't know if you can catch that. Uh, what about this eagle? Anyone know what that symbolizes? No, actually not. Actually, America, I think I have a laser here. Is, um, there's an Uncle Sam that's actually caught in the spider's web, which is yeah another comment about you know, how this is in affecting the entire sort of world scene. Yeah, do you know what? Yeah, yeah. So the, the eagle is Germany. So it's sort of basically because France and England made this pact, it, it threatened Germany. So, but there seems to be also this implicit French concern that they've made this pact with England and the spider is now sort of chomping through all the territories um, and weaving its web over what might be France, but that there's also this looming threat of Germany in the picture. So again, it's interesting, and I, I could have included many more of these, which show sort of these, one, it's an animal image, two, um, and it, it, they place them really across the whole entire earth, because they're seeing these empires as they're functioning in the world scene. All right, you ready for one more? Or I think two more. All right, what about this one? It's a little more modern. Anyone know what this refers to? You are alive for it. That's a hint. OK, yeah. Yeah, I think it's partly right. Clearly, Russia, this big bear, there was a specific incident in which they, yeah. Russia invaded Georgia. Yeah, Russia invaded Georgia. So again, take the animal image. It's interestingly laying over the entire map. And then what do you make about, again, bears could be cute and cuddly. This bear, not so much. I mean, what does it tell us about Russia? What's the implicit critique coming out of this? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Aiden. Yeah. Like taking up all this space and yet still wants more. So it's kind of like a 
Yeah, clearly greedy. And what sort of tips you off to even more of the greed? Yeah. Like the honey. Yeah. The bear licking his lips. Yeah. Right. He's, he's sort of taking this entire country to give it to his, you know, cub. Um, a little bit like that octopus image of, of Great Britain. That yeah, there's some kind of greed involved in this. Oh, good point. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Right. Sort of this industrious, it's trying to make its uh, you know, place in the world as this little country, and you know, it's thwarted by this big bad bear. Um, OK, one more. A little older. What do we have here? So what's this eagle? Yeah, a little different than the German eagle we just saw. Yeah, this is United States imperialism. And so when you think empire, I could have started off asking you, you know, name a bunch of empires you might have heard of or studied, question whether or not, you know, Great Britain, yes, we've heard it as empire. Does the US qualify as an empire? And that might be something we could all debate about. But um, here, clearly, yes. And, and what's it sort of, is this a good or a bad portrayal of the US? Yeah. Yeah, there seems to be not so much a vicious or greedy, but a kind of a protective stance. And yeah, sort of enveloping, let me protect you under my wings. Um, but you see places that um, you know, are still associated with US. You have Puerto Rico. Um, I think there was, I think there's Hawaii. So again, it's, but notice, please, you know, keep in mind that this is, is taking over the sort of the entire world. Um, and that's sort of important to think about with empire. Yeah. Yeah. Down and it almost looks like sick or tired. Oh, that's Instead interesting. Instead of his head being perched up, like in a more prominent stance, it almost looks. I don't really know. What it's yeah, I, and I, I think it might be argued. I mean, well, I sort of made a case for why it's protective, but I wonder, right? Why isn't it sort of standing up proud, like you sort of envision eagles? Um, so there might be sort of some sort of element of criticism in there too, that it maybe the U.S. thinks it's this caring, you know, empire, but. It's, it's maybe it's sort of reaching out to them with its beak. I, but yeah, these are just to get your, your mind going about thinking about images of empire. And you know, they're, they're up to the present day. We talk about this and how do you view empire. So um, now we're going to actually I'll turn to the goal of today. So instead of reading it, you can copy it. Um, <laughs> to explore how Judeans understood the advent of imperial rule and consider the possibility that just as they experienced different empires, they also had vastly different views of empires. So we've encountered so far two empires. Anyone recall who we've encountered? Quick pop quiz. Yeah. 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 And one before them. Yeah. So Assyrians that you recall in 722 came in and sort of got rid of Israel and threatened Judah. And then, yes, the Babylonians in the 6th century uh, captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So uh, we're now entering a period where Judah and Judeans are going to really be subject to a series of empires. Um, and so really, empire is going to dominate how they kind of view the world and also their own place in it and also their view of God um, and how they sort of anticipate what the future will look for, uh, like to them. So, this is our goal. So just be open to the fact that, you know, again, these, these texts are going to evince you know, the struggle to come to terms with what empire means to them. Um, and they're going to change what they think. And it's going to actually depend on which empire is sort of around. Um, OK, so now we're going to turn to Daniel 2, which I'm hoping you all at least looked at. Um, we're really just going to focus on the dream and its interpretation. But it, does someone want to give us sort of the summary of the whole narrative leading up to it, sort of intro the dream? Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a king who came to Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. He, uh, he had a dream and he called upon um, people, the wise people of the area, like the Chaldeans. Yeah, so basically sorcerers, magicians, anyone that might be able to interpret a dream. And he asked them to interpret the dream or to tell, I think he wanted them to tell him what his dream was. Yeah, a little trickier. Right, and he said that if you get it wrong, he'll kill you. If you get it right, he'll give you wealth. 
Yeah. And none of them are able to solve the dream. And then Daniel comes along before the beginner is put to bed. And he comes in and, um, and tells him what his dream was. And he's correct. And uh, but the dream was revealed to him by God of Israel. Yeah, first he has to pray to God to sort of give him the, you know, the courage or the power to, inter to know the dream. Yeah, so and he's able to do it and successfully. Okay, well, I'll, we're actually going to get to that. So that's, that's a great lead up. So basically, the king, the Babylonian king. So the stories of Daniel um, are set in Babylonia. Um, in, you know, a, as individuals who have been exiled from Judah, um, Daniel and his friends are now in the court of the Babylonian king. So they sort of are front and central in the Babylonian empire. And yes, this is King Nebuchadnezzar, the famous um, emperor who you know, was the one who destroyed Jer Jerusalem and the temple and exiled the people. So he has this dream, um, and this is what it is. So basically, it's relatively brief. You have, um, and I sort of visually divided it up so you can really see the components of it. So first, in verse 31, he tells the king that he, he saw, the king saw, I mean, again, he has to tell the king actually what his dream was. Uh, you saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was awesome. So, big image. So, now you see why I showed you a lot of visual images. Um, he's having one himself. Okay, the head, the verse 32, the head of this image was of fine gold, its breast and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze. So it has a few parts to it, um, starting with gold, then you've got silver, bronze, and then its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So again, with sort of four parts to this image um, that he's looking at. Um, and as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it smote the image on its feet of clay, iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Um, OK, so any sort of reactions to that when you read it or are reading it now? As to if we think of this, and we're going to find out the interpretation says it's, it has to do with empire. What, what does this image of empire evoke? Think about sort of, you know, you're going to have to sort of visualize it in your head, like Daniel's, you know, seeing it, or the king saw it. What, what is it, what is it sort of, think about the parts, any ideas? Good, bad, empire, yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, so hold that thought. I'm going to sort of contextualize that a little bit. But yes, he's seeing one thing, right? So just like we saw the you know, British Empire is one big octopus, he's seeing one big sort of statue image that looks a little bit like a man, I would guess, because it has human parts. Um, yeah, so hold that thought. That's good. And somebody else I thought I saw or the same thought? All right, what about the precious metals? What do you make of that? Yeah, and it's a little bit weakened by the clay because it gets mixed with clay. But right, so it's all you know what would be sort of termed precious metals. Um, yeah, decreasing in value, but I would argue even the last, you know, with iron. I mean, it's still valuable. Um, okay, so let's actually skip to the interpretation because that might help us sort of make more sense of this. Um, a little longer. Um, so now he's telling the interpretation, um, and you see in verse thirty-seven. He reveals, you, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the sons of men, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the air, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, 
because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things, and like iron which crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end and shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be hereafter. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. Okay. Now my question for you is, so what are these four parts of this statue? Who wants to take a stab at sort of guessing what they, they symbolize then? The first one's a little obvious. What is it? What's the head of gold? The current king. Yeah, the current king. Well, it's interesting because it, uh, he identifies the head as actually specifically Nebuchadnezzar. But then what are the other parts? Yeah, I mean, they're all kingdoms. So there actually isn't a word for empire. So we have to sort of assume these are, you know, empire, larger kingdoms. Um, right, so we've got how many of them? Yeah, we got four, right? So let me ask you a question. What's the order? If you had to chart them out timeline-wise, what's the order of them? Which one is first on your timeline? Yeah, right, why, why would you say that? <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of asking you an obvious question, so He's I'm not tricking talking tricky. about you are the head of gold, your kingdom, right, your empire right now. Right, yes, yeah. And then what does he say about the other ones? After you. Right? Yeah, so there's a clear, you know, the, you see in verse uh, 39, after you shall arise another kingdom. And inferior because, right, the metals are getting inferior in quality. So it seems like we have a nice sort of timeline of four empires. Well, what do we make about, to sort of complicate it, what do we make about, look at verse 45, and we had a similar sort of saying in the previous dream itself. Um, so this stone comes along, this mysterious stone, and it hits the, this image. Where does it hit? Yeah, Emily. Yeah, it hits the feet first, right? So what happens? It then breaks the feet first, so you see, it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Actually, if we go back, same thing here. It breaks them into pieces, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, they all broke down. So my question for you is, if, if you're going to chart out you know, the history of these four empires, and it did, it's, it seemed like first there's Babylonia, then there's another one, there's another one, and there's a fourth one. But when we go to destroy them in the image, it's the reverse. So, I mean, make sense of that, right? How would you then say that the order of their destruction occurred? How would you plot that on the timeline? It would be the opposite, right? So you would say, oddly enough, that the fourth one gets destroyed first, and then the, all the rest crumble down. So this is actually where I, you know, it's a little puzzling because we think of terms of sort of linear history, right? One empire rises and falls, and then the next, next and the next. There's a something else going on here that's different. And it actually has to do with the comment earlier about what kind of image is this? It's one image. So they're all connected. So you can't have the feet fall and not have the head fall because it's lost its base. So the interesting thing is we might think, you know, if I said chart out, you know, the Roman Empire, then the Holy Roman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire, I mean, they're all separate em empires in history and they all you know, have their own sort of tenure in, in the land. But this, they all are connected. So when one falls, they all fall. So I think what we have here um, is an image of sort of an eternal one empire. And yes, the leaders might change, the locales of where they rule from might change, but empire is a constant in this, in this world. From this Jewish perspective in this text, empire is, is constant always has been, always will. 
um, until this final end with the stone. But that it doesn't really matter where they're coming from because they're all connected. There's just sort of one constant empire. Um, and that's what gets destroyed, the sort of imperial phenomenon, not specific empires. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my reading of it. Um, anyone sort of agree, disagree, make, want to make a comment? I'm open to whether or not you buy that. OK, I'll take that as you all agree. So, <laughs> um, OK, so let's also talk just about a moment you know, if we had this view of sort of this eternal, monolithic, all-encompassing empire, where is it? We have a few clues as to where it exists in the world. Any clue for in this interpretation where this empire is or how much of the landscape it's taking up? What is, what is, let me ask a different question. I'll frame it a different way. What does God have to do with this view of empire, this image of empire? Right, so clearly a God of Israel, the one Daniel and his friends you know, worship and are faithful to. Um, and how does he come into play? I mean, what, is, what would you say God thinks about this empire? It's, a, it's the land that God's given him. Yeah, he, we very explicitly says that in verse 37, God has given this kingdom to, Babylon, to, to Nebuchadnezzar. So this imperial phenomenon, this, this one image, this eternal empire, is something that God has allowed to, to be on the scene. And, and how much of the world is allowed to rule? It's all of it, right? So think about, it says, everywhere, wherever people dwell, look at verse 38. Wherever there are sons of men, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, you rule over them all. So not only is it just this eternal empire, it's all-encompassing. It really is the entire world, and God has allowed it. So where does its power come from? God. So there's something uh, more intrinsically related to God um, in this empire than you might have expected. And in that regard, how, how should we view this empire in terms of sort of is it, is it good for the Judeans? Is it bad for the Judeans? What do you think they think about it from this, this image, this view? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what makes you say that? Right, so there's a little bit of, okay, God's endorsing this, right? right? And it will be destroyed. I don't want to ignore the fact that one day it's going to be replaced with sort of God's kingdom. But yeah, for the time being, God has sort of put you know, the stamp of approval on it. Uh, what about the actual image of it? Like, again, you've encountered, pretend you're having this dream, and you have this dream of a big you know, image, looks kind of like a man, of precious metals. What do you think of it? How do you react? Is it you know, intimidating? Is it scary? Is it? Peaceful, you know, sort of spectacular. Or let me ask you this: Is it doing anything? I'd say it'd probably be intimidating. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly big. Or I don't know. There's no indication it's big. I sort of that's my impression. But yeah, that. Why do you say that? OK, so it's probably, let's say it's impressive. I mean, he actually says that. Go back, uh, verse 31. This image mighty, so maybe it's large. We don't quite know. Exceeding brightness, its appearance was awesome. So yeah, I mean, there's something sort of breathtaking about it. So it could be intimidating, but does it do anything? Like if we were going to say, what, is this, what do these empires do? What does this one empire do in the, in the world? I mean, is it doing bad things? Is it doing good things? Yeah, I mean, so it's probably wealthy. It's sort of like that very first image of Persia we saw. Um, but it's not actually moving, right? So it, and you'll see where I'm getting with this, going with this when you see the next image. So keep in mind, it's, for all we know, it's just it's solitary. It's standing there. He's just seeing it. Um, OK, so that was Daniel 2. Now let's, we're going to compare it to another chapter in Daniel, um, Daniel 7. OK, so 
lots of scholars have noted the similarities of them and said that maybe Daniel 7 uh, comes after Daniel 2 and really sort of builds on it. But uh, I think they're actually pretty different. And I'm going to try to sort of show that to you. Uh, and I've, I've taken the courtesy of you know, breaking it down in a chart, which I hope visually will sort of emphasize the difference. So just what the first verse says. So I know you haven't read Daniel 7. So we've read Daniel 1. That's when Nebuchadnezzar has the dream. It gets him upset. He wakes up. Now, who has the dream in Daniel 7? Yeah, Daniel himself. So it's very similar, right? We have the the, the rain, we know when it's taking place, but it's Daniel that has the dream and the visions, and he wakes up and he wants to write them down. So right off the bat, I would argue that there's something different going on here, that before, everything's taking place in the court of this, this Babylonian emperor, but now we have this shift. Babylonian emperor, we've got to mention because we know the year, but he's not in the court, he's not even in the, in the story. So he's, it, it's now, who's... The focus of this, it's going to be Daniel. So the emperor is sort of backseat. He's not even in the picture. Um, so keep that in mind as we sort of progress, that the setting is, is entirely different. OK. Now we move to the actual dream. Anyone notice, now I've put the verses um, and lined them up where they sort of have similarities. Where does Daniel 2's? Now we, we, we had this nice summary of the whole narrative up to the dream. It clearly took a lot of verses, because where are we at verse in, in the story of Jan, Daniel 2? All the way at verse 31. Now, if you look at Daniel 7, is there any story that we're missing? No. So just like Daniel's the one having the dream, now there's no, even, there's no story about the, the emperor in the, in the imperial court. It's gone. It's all about this one Judean having a dream. So empire is sort of, you know, there's, a, there's something I think power related going on here is now Daniel has the power to have his own dream and doesn't need to see the king's dream. Um, okay, so now if we actually sort of line up the par parts of the dream, anything sort of strike you visually just looking at this chart without even reading Daniel 7, what sort of is different between the left and the right? Yeah, Claire? Um, Daniel 7, there's a lot more description. Yeah, I mean, visually, again, this is one of those things you wouldn't get maybe if you read Daniel 2 and then read Daniel 7. But when you line them up like this, you see, whoa, there is a lot more in Daniel 7 than there's in Daniel 2 about the dream and the parts of the dream. Um, and we're going to see that sort of all the way through, that Daniel 7 is much more focused on what this image of empires. Um, OK, so let's actually read it. It's a little weird, I'm warning you. Um, OK, so Daniel 4, so he, oh, sorry, Daniel 2 through 3. He, he wakes up and he saw, says, he saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, different one from another. So something should strike you as different from Daniel 2's vision already. What is it? Yeah. Either one. Yeah. Yeah, so we made it, I made a big deal um, about the fact that it's one, you know, one statue, one image in Daniel 2. Now, all of a sudden, we have distinct, four distinct things coming up. So just keep that in mind, that we've sort of started to break them apart. Um, OK, and also, who's, who's not involved in this? I mean, we saw in the last chapter God, right? God is the one who, who allows the, the statue. I mean, he, he gives the gold um, head and he makes that Bab uh, Babylonia, Nebuchadnezzar. But here, God's not a part of this. These, these beasts just come up out of the sea. Uh, OK, so the first was like a lion. It had eagle's wings. Uh, then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand upon two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and lo, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrible and dreadful and exceedingly strong, 
and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking arrogantly. All right, so clearly we have a lot more text to deal with. It's a much more involved image. It's not just four metals. What do you make of this? Any sort of gut reactions to this view? This, this vision that poor Daniel is, you know, seeing. Yeah. Well, while Daniel seeing what I guess you could consider the possibility that empire was viewed in a positive light, Daniel 7 kind of takes it into a very, very negative, um, scary. Image. Yeah, I mean, what sort of anything jump out at you specifically? I mean, I think you're right. I agree 100%. Yeah, right. You don't want to run into any of these, you know, um, at, they, right, they're all terrifying. And even though, I mean, this is now you see where I was going with the image itself. The, the first, in Daniel 2, the statue, yes, it might be awesome and mighty and striking, but there isn't anything that compares to this. And you have, right, these beasts, not a single one of them is peaceful, right? They all have elements of predators. We have a lion, we have a leopard, a bear, and then we have this fourth one that, isn't even like anything we know of. It just has got lots of teeth and its horns and it's um, terrorizing um, the whole landscape. So my other question for you is, you know, right, it's a scary prospect to see them. Um, and what are they doing? I mean, they're, how would you describe their actions? I mean, first of all, they're doing something, right? The statue was just standing there. We didn't have any action coming from it. Now we've got lots of action, and they're all sort of doing their own thing, but all vicious, right? I mean, there's the, the rise, there's devouring much flesh, there's the stamping of things in, in pieces. So all of a sudden, you should be struck by the difference between sort of this solitary, static image of the statue versus these four distinct beasts that are scary and sort of horrible, and they're all sort of stamping around in front of him and moving and, and doing things. So uh, it's a drastically you know, different image right off the bat. Yeah. I also thought it was interesting that with the first two beasts, they were told mm -hmm. what to do. Like, yeah. Stand like a man and told to devour. And the third one was given something which is a little bit different than being told. And then the last one just kind of did it on its own. Yeah. So kind of like the sense of losing control and things getting out of hand. Right, so in the first, in Daniel 2, the, the parts are getting less valuable. But they're not necessarily getting more dangerous. Um, they're just less valuable. Here, they're getting, right, this fourth beast is clearly, I mean, it says explicitly, it's different from all the others. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's not, you know, if you had to have your pick of which one you'd want to run into, I mean, you might go with the first one that at least has some, you know, we find out that it has, um, some kind of man components to it. At least it has a mind of a man, so maybe it's a little, it's a little more peaceful. Who knows? But yeah, I mean, they're definitely getting more vicious as we go along. Um, yeah, and, and it's interesting that you know we're not sure who tells that second beast to, you know, arise and devour much flesh, and we're not sure who gives that mind of a man. So that's that's definitely you know ambiguous. Um, okay, so let's actually go to the interpretation now. Or, I'm sorry, this is still the dream. Um, okay, so we had the end of all of these. If you recall, in the first, in Daniel 2, they were going to be hit by the stone and it was going to shatter the first, the bottom part first, and then everything else was going to fall. So, here, again, what do you notice right off the bat about the end of these empires? Just visually, as far as the two sides. Yeah, we. Daniel 7 cares a whole lot more about what's going to happen to empires, I would argue, than maybe Daniel 2 does. Um, okay, so devote, it you know, just devotes a lot more space to it, yeah. Um, I don't know if this is going to go exactly with it, but this uh, format is also echoed in Story of Joseph in Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, definitely the, in the foreign court, yeah, but only, only Daniel 2. 
because Daniel 7, we don't know that he's in the court, right? He's not interacting with any king in particular. Oh, in the dream, I think, oh, of the Joseph's dreams, are there any? But I think it's like star and like wheat shafts. Yeah, but there's this dream interpretation thing. Oh, because the famine coming up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, I wonder, because scholars have definitely compared this to Joseph, at least the Daniel 2, as far as his ability to interpret a king's dream. Um, okay, so got a lot more about the end. So again, weird sort of imagery. Um, so as Daniel's looking, thrones were placed, and one that was ancient of days took his seat. His raiment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands of thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words which the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Okay, so a much more detailed scene of the end of these empires. Um, what about their particular fates? So as I asked you at the first, just sort of plot out the order of them. You know, in the, in, back in the dream itself, you had, right, these four beasts, and we find out they each come up out of the sea, and he's seeing them one after the other. So you could sort of say there's an order to them, one through four. What about their fates? Are they connected? Look in verse 11 and 12. How does the fourth beast meet its end? Yeah, it's burnt, right? It has this sort of special judgment. First it's slain, and then its body is destroyed and burnt in fire. What about the other three? They're preserved, they're taken away. Yeah, so they, they also have, uh, I mean, maybe their fates are a little bit connected, but it's not like that statue in Daniel 2 where the one stone wipes them all out because they're connected. These are not connected. That fourth beast can have an independent fate, and it does. And the three that you think logically and chronologically might come before that fourth one are dealt with afterwards. So, I mean, again, there, there's some sort of something going on where you don't quite know if they're a linear sort of progression, or maybe they're all in the world at the same time and they're competing, but they, they're separate. They all have different fates. They're not connected as that statue in Daniel 2 is. They all are four distinct beasts. Um, okay, what do you make of this whole you know, judgment scene? This has given a lot of scholars a lot of um, angst to try to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Oh, interesting, right. So they're sort of still on the scene. There's a possibility. And he killed the, the military leaders were killed. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's any correlation. That's interesting. I never thought about that. Um, but if we think about it the same way, so who's, who's sort of allowing them? Let me ask you. So in that case, that king of Judah was allowed to sort of still be on, you know, alive because the king of Babylonia allowed him to be. So who's allowing these emperors, empires to maybe not be slain right immediately? Or... Conversely, who's slaying that first one? Okay. Yes. Okay, right. Good. We've got this figure, this Ancient of Days. Any, any guesses? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it's, it's God. Um, and this sort of seems to be like a heavenly court going on, right? He, 
he's, he's there, he's clearly majestic, he's got, you know, he's sitting, a th he has a throne, um, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot of somethings that are serving him. So whether or not the angels, people, um, but right, he actually judges um, these beasts um, and, and decrees their fate. Um, and then, like, too, there's also this ending where there's going to be a new kingdom that comes directly from God that's going to be eternal, that's going to replace these other empires. Um, okay, so let's actually get to now the interpretation. All right, so if you see Daniel 7, what's Daniel's feeling about this vision? We didn't really have his feeling about that first dream. Now how does he react to this? If you look at 15, his spirit within him is anxious and the visions of his head are alarming to him. So much like you know, some of you commented, this is a scary thing and he's not, it's not a dream you really want to have. Um, and so he wakes up and he's immediately you know, terrified and he actually seeks out the interpretation, um, not from himself, like he was able to interpret in Daniel 2, um, he sort of gets it from this uh, one that he's, he's kind of in the vision, so he sort of still, he asks some being that's nearby, maybe an angel, it's unclear, um, and therefore gets the interpretation. So very clearly we read, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings, so again, four distinct things. And they shall rise out of the earth. Again, not because God is making them arise. They're just arising. Uh, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even for, forever and ever. OK. So now I have sort of lined up where in Daniel 2 it talks about the first beasts, um, the first one through, th I mean, sorry, not beasts, the first at, through third parts of the statue. And notice on the other side, nothing about the first three beasts. You get nothing in the interpretation, other than this mention in the first verse 17 that there are of four kings. So there, the shift in the interpretation has totally ignored the first three beasts. This, they don't care to interpret them at all. And you can see how much do we care in Daniel 7 about the fourth beast. A whole lot, right? So, I mean, there's a lot on the fourth kingdom in Daniel 2, but Daniel 7, you get a lot devoted. When you compare it to the absolute lack of anything on the first three beasts, the focus is clearly on the fourth beast. Um, you get a lot of repetition of what, it, of, of what we found out from the dream, but still, it's the same vicious fourth uh, kingdom. If you read verse 23, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it into pieces. Um, and as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom shall ten kings arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the former, and he shall put down three kings, and he shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change the seasons and the law, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and a half or half the time. Okay, so again, focus is clearly shifted to the fourth beast, um, which, any guesses as to why? Why would you be focused on, if, if, if you're, think about the writer of this chapter. Why, why put Daniel, why put his entire focus really on this fourth beast? Well, think of them chronologically. So if I said they're sort of distinct beasts and they're distinct empires, which empire do you think, which beast do you think that the writer of this chapter is living under? Yeah, yeah right. So it seems that in this chapter, the writer is so focused on actually the empire that he's experiencing. Um, and I'll actually... Um, a little bit later tell you what this empire is. We're going to sort of break it down. But yeah, it's because the shift is sort of so focused on what he's going through. Um, and you see some clues, and I'll, I'll let you know what those are. And you see verse 25, um, we find out there's this one little horn, and he shall speak words against the Most High, and he's, he's going to change the seasons and the law. So um, from this, scholars think this is a reference to um, the Seleucid Greek king Antiochus IV, uh, which you might know from the Hanukkah story, 
um, that fought against the Maccabees. So we're, I'll tell you about that history. But again, it seems that the author of Daniel 7, as opposed to the author of Daniel 2, is very much focused on the fourth beast because that's the empire he's living under. Um, which tells you what about Daniel 2, if it's not focused, if that author is not focused on, on any one particular empire, sort of focused with the image of empire general. I'll put it this way. Are they, I sort of set it up, so, and I keep talking about them as two different authors. Are they living in the same time? Yeah, no. So I sort of saw some no's. OK, yeah, they're coming from two different imperial worlds um, and two different perspectives. And again, I think the first one, Daniel 2, is an image of empire that sort of, empire is a given, right? It's, it's, on the, it's, it's taken over the whole world. It's always going to be there. God sort of lets it be there. Um, it's really majestic. It's maybe not so scary, but definitely sort of powerful and awesome. Whereas Daniel 7, all of a sudden, we've got these horrific beasts. They're distinct. They come and go. They're acting, and they're vicious. And um, you can see that they're, they, they can be defeated, and they're going to be defeated by God. So it's a different shift. So you sort of understanding empire is something that is transient. It's not always going to be there, and it can be defeated. And that's the, the new, you know, I'll talk about this as an earlier outlook versus a later outlook. So um, OK. So why such different views? Um, actually, we'll skip. That's the same. They both envision an eternal kingdom coming at the end. Um, oh, one last thing. After the dream is done, Daniel gets a lot of rewards for getting the interpretation correct in Daniel 2. Notice in Daniel 7, it ends. He's upset. That's it. So you see that in Daniel 2, the whole dream is couched in a narrative that is sort of pro-empire, right? Because what's Daniel doing by interpreting this dream? I mean, what does he get out of that? It's not maybe necessarily his whole goal, but what happens to him after the dream? He successfully does it, if you look on the left, the last verse, or last two verses. Yeah, so I mean, what does that say? If you are in an empire and you and you are there at the core, and you interpret this dream successfully, and then you become part of the empire. I mean, what, what's Daniel's you know, role in that empire in the, first, in the first situation? If you read that text, you're a Judean, and you're reading this text, or hearing this text, and you think, how should you respond to empire? Yeah, live with it. I mean, it's sort of like, OK, you're there. Make the best of it. If you can succeed in the empire, go for it. Daniel 7, not so, you know, not so favorable towards empire. It's not even on in, the, in the story, right? So there's no sense in Daniel 7 that you, know, you want to assimilate it all into the empire or achieve anything in the empire. Um, it's totally separate from the empire um, because the empire, again, is a horrifying you know, iron stomping with lots of teeth kind of beast. Um, OK, so this is our timeline of empires. So, uh, you'll see we began again with 722. We first had that Israel falling to Assyria. Then where we sort of left off last week, we have Judah falling to Babylonia in 586. The temple's destroyed. Uh, the Judeans are exiled to Babylon. Uh, and then a mere 50 years later, uh, Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon and it allows the Jews, if they want, to return to Judah and rebuild the temple. Not all of them do, but uh, some do, and they do rebuild the temple. So um, what might you think of Cyrus of Persia? Good guy or bad guy, according to the Jews? Good yeah, good guy. And I'm going to show you some biblical um, text that you know, demonstrates that they viewed him positively. Um, but sort of fast forward, so they live. Um, under sort of Persian control until Alexander the Great of Greece uh, or Macedonia conquers Persia. Uh, he dies soon after and divides his empire up between his generals. Um, and the two that really affect Judah are Ptolemy, who's in Egypt, and Seleucus, who's in Syria. And so what's between Egypt in the west and Syria in the east? Poor little Judah is right in the center, and they are just going to fight over it. it sort of becomes the border. Um, and you'll see that one century, the Ptolemies are in control. 
and then the Seleucids gain control. And so they're sort of constantly seeing the back and forth between these two empires. Um, I think at one point within 20 years, the control of Jerusalem changes seven times. So can you imagine if you're living here in New York and you know the control who's controlling it changes that you know in your life, many of you I'm sure are 20, seven different times. I mean, it's a drastic amount, right? It's not peaceful. Um, they're seeing a lot of empires sort of coming and going right in front of them. Um, then we have in the middle of the second century, Antiochus IV, he's a Seleucid. Um, up to then, the Seleucids had been pretty good to the Judeans um, and letting them sort of keep their religious laws. Antiochus IV uh, basically prohibits the um, observance of the Torah. Again, I'm giving you a sort of an oversimplified version for the sake of time. But uh, so they, he starts to persecute them. And then the Maccabees, again, this is the Hanukkah story, the Maccabees revolt successfully against Antiochus, and they establish their own dynasty. They're actually called the Hasmoneans. And they rule uh, for about a century. And then Rome comes into the picture, another great empire. And then Rome um, allows sort of different varying uh, amounts of control. At one point, you see Herod the Great uh, rules as a client king, but Rome is still always in the picture. Eventually, Judah gets fed up with Rome and revolts um, in the first century CE uh, unsuccessfully. They're not like the Maccabees. They, don't, they didn't end up winning. And the second temple is destroyed and then never rebuilt. So this is like a very quick you know, speed through uh, version of lots of empires um, that Judeans are experiencing um, in these centuries. Uh, so, if we think about our two images, I found these you know, online so you can have the visual of them. Daniel 2 versus Daniel 7. Which empires, I sort of alluded to it earlier, which empire or imperial experiences do you think these two dreams came out of? We have the statue on the left and then these on the right, these beasts on the right. Okay, so good. More stable. Uh, which, back to our timeline, which one do you think that is? Anyone else guess? If you're on the right track, think of where in this whole sort of scheme is empire somewhat okay for the Jews? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we've got a few down here. Yeah, Cyrus of Persia, right? So there's definitely, you know, it's an imperial rule, but it's relatively stable. And let's actually go to how the Persians talk about themselves. You see, um, the first is coming actually from uh, what's known as the Cyrus Cylinder. It was found, um, and this is coming directly from Persia, from Cyrus. Um, it's a big, long document. He talks about how he conquered Babylonia. But within it, we get um, you know, him talking about his own sort of view of his, of his empire. I am Cyrus, king of the world, great king, legitimate king, king of Babylon, king of Sumer, and Akkad, king of the four rims of the earth. So what kind of you know, empire do the Persians want to portray themselves as having? I mean, where is he control of? Or what he, is he in control of? Everywhere, right? So the whole world, the entire four, you know, four corners of the earth. Also, I should say that by this point, um, Akkad no longer existed. So he's now declared himself king of some place that doesn't exist. What does that tell you about his empire? If you want to, why, why, decla why declare yourself king of somewhere that doesn't exist? Right, but it's glorious in the past, meaning that, yeah? Yes, again, eternal, right? That, that he is the king of something that, yes, there might have been these other battles, but they're all part of his kingdom, his eternal kingdom that covers the whole world. So again, that, I think, 
fits the image, the one on the left, better. That you have this one, one image, one statue that's mighty and glorious and that we, we learned God allowed to rule over the whole earth. Um, and the Persians think that about themselves. We have a similar edict. Darius, has come, he comes two emperors after Cyrus, um, another Persian. And he's talking about uh, his own rule. These are the provinces which became rebellious. The lie made them rebellious, so that these deceived men deceive the people. And the lie he's referring to um, is the negation of the truth. And the truth is that Persia is eternal. And so these people that rebelled spread this lie that, that Persia wasn't eternal. So the Persians themselves really wanted to evoke this image of them as eternal um, people. And they actually said that uh, the gods wanted them to be, not surprisingly, the Babylonian god allowed them to conquer Babylon. And then if we switch to the biblical text, um, deals with the Persians on a number of occasions. You'll see in Isaiah, uh, 45 is sort of a classic uh, verse cited about Cyrus. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Um, I will go before you and will level the mountains. All right, on and on and on. So how do we view Cyrus? I mean, how is this prophecy, prophecy viewing Cyrus coming from Isaiah? What what do we what what should our view be of Cyrus from this? Well, anointed, yeah, and actually the word the word for anointed um, is related to the word for Messiah. So not Messiah in the sense that he's kind of some sort of you know divine supernatural being, but that he is specifically anointed. Kings are anointed. He's anointed by God, meaning he's chosen by God to do what? Conquer. He's gonna, God is going to help him subdue nations. He's going to level the mountains. And it's all, if you look at verse 4, for the sake of, my, of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen. So Cyrus, from the biblical perspective, is good because God has sort of given him the go-ahead, has given him the power to conquer Babylonia, to help the Jews go back to Judah and rebuild the temple. So from the biblical perspective, Persians are good. Um, you'll see in the book of Ezra, I talk about it, a similar, Ezra 1 talks about uh, Cyrus in a similar way, that in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. So again, God is sanctioning Cyrus's actions. Um, notice anything peculiar in Ezra 5.13. Read it closely. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. Anything strike you as odd? Okay, that could be um, a sort of going for something else, something more basic that sort of, I think if you read it too quickly, you miss. This is Babylon. Yeah, okay. And we know Ezra knows him as king of Persia. We have it right above. Why in the world is, king, is Cyrus king of Babylon here? He's not, right? He's king of Persia. The text knows it. Why put him as king of Babylon? What did we learn in the first edict of Cyrus? that he himself says he's king of Babylon. So I think what's going on here is that the Persians had a view of themselves as eternal, as God, as, as any of the people they conquered. They believed that the gods of those people had allowed them to conquer it. They were eternal, and therefore they were going to sort of, in order to have a stable empire, allow people to have their temples and, and worship as they wanted. And it seems that that view that the Persians had of themselves, of an eternal one empire, is somehow absorbed by the biblical text itself that views Cyrus as good and views him as you know, working on behalf of God. And then likewise, 
this sort of gets translated into Daniel 2's vision of empire, sort of one eternal thing. It doesn't, it, it's awesome, but it's not scary. So it's there, it's present, it's mighty, but it's not doing anything necessarily bad. Okay. So with that, let's go to the second sex. So section is, is the view of Daniel 7. Now, I should say that scholars sort of have, have deduced that the first stories in Daniel 2 um, and actually 1 through 6 of Daniel come from an earlier period. Um, and so even though it says Daniel's in Babylon, it's actually um, it's speaking about the later Persian period, and then this comes even later in the Greek period. So again, this is a description. It's coming from a book called First Maccabees. It didn't make it into the Bible, but it is um, coming from about, I would say, the first century is BC, so um, it is a, you know, a text from antiquity talking about a view of the Greeks. So this is Alexander's coming onto the scene. Um, so we get after Alexander, son of Philip the Macedonian, who came from the hand, land of the Kittim, had defeated King Darius of the Persians and the Medes. He succeeded him as king. He had previously become king of Greece. He fought many battles, conquered strongholds, and put to death the kings of the earth. He advanced to the ends of the earth and plundered many nations. He gathered a very strong army and ruled over countries, nations, and princes, and they became tributary to him. And after Alexander had reigned 12 years, he died. Then his officers began to rule each in his own place. They all put on crowns after his death, and so did their descendants after them for many years, and they caused many evils on the earth. So, okay, we had this view of the Persians from the Bible, pretty good. What's the view of the Greeks from the Judean perspective? The opposite, right? So they come and they, they plunder, they um, destroy, they're nothing sort of but vicious and they battle. And this last statement, they cause many evils on the earth. So again, which view does Daniel 7 sort of show us? Not one of the peaceful or stable Persians, but of this tumultuous period under the Greeks. And as you recall from your timeline, it's, it's bad. It's constantly changing. So there are constantly different beasts on the scene. And they, even, they, they end up revolting. So it's not stable. It's not peaceful. Empire to them is bad. So it, again, it causes many evils on the earth. So I think Daniel's, these two chapters in Daniel sort of come from two different perspectives that the Jews were, were experiencing based on their different um, experiences of empire. So we have one under the Persians, and then we have one under the later Greeks. Um, and then anyone, I'll sort of close. Any guesses as to, so we have the... The Romans that enter the scene. Now, the Romans are after the biblical period, so they're, they're not included in the Bible at all. Um, now, lots of Jewish writers um, interpret Daniel in the Roman period, and they, they choose, which chapter do you think they choose to speak about the Romans? If you are living under the Romans, and you wanted to interpret something of Daniel and talk about empires, which one would you choose? First of all, are the Romans good or bad? Sort of, again, I'm oversimplifying, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they do. Anyone familiar um, with the book of Revelation, which is written under the Roman Empire um, in the New Testament, actually has, um, I think it's chapter 13, um, has pulls from Daniel 7, has image of a beast coming out of the sea, and there's a dragon, and it's, it's a vicious, it's a vicious uh, scene. So yeah, countless Jewish writers, after Daniel you know, is put into its final form, talk about empire, and they constantly pull from Daniel 7. Because again, the Romans, like the Greeks, didn't end up being so good. I mean, it was not stable, um, and we have two significant revolts. So you can see that, again, the way the empire sort of interacted with the Jews really affected how they viewed them. Um, and you really, it's sort of, in its final form, um, 
got put into Daniel in sort of two drastically different images. So I think when you read them, sort of skim them, you might have thought, OK, there are two images of empire. They've got four components. But hopefully, I think I uh, demonstrated to you that they're actually really different. Um, and this, again, is growing really out of the historical context of uh, this period as we move forward.